Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Super Data Brothers. I am Ryan Dolly, and I am flying solo today. Eric is not able to join us, but have I got a great show for you. That's right. We are doing a new series on the top emerging BI tools for 2024. And of course, we have to kick that off with our good friend of the show and, and one of our favorite up and coming uh, BI tools, Ali Hughes from Count. So I'm going to bring Ali on in just a second. But before I do, a couple points of order. Number one, this is a live show, folks. It is more fun for me, it is more fun for Ali, and it is more fun for you if you get your comments, reactions, and questions into the chat. We're going to be doing a live demo of Count. It is a very different BI tool than anything you've ever seen before. And so I want to see those reactions in there because uh, it'll be cool. It'll be cool. Um, you're, you're going to be kind of amazed by what you see here, I think. That's point of order number one. Of course, if you let us know where you're watching from, we will shout you out. So whether you're on YouTube or LinkedIn, let us know in the chat or the LinkedIn comments where you're watching from, and I will give you that shout out. Second point of order, meet the Super Data Brothers. Folks, I'm going to be at Data Council on March 26th to 28th in Austin, Texas, at representing good data down there. Um, and so come by the good data booth. Say hello. I'm going to be queuing up some interesting interviews with people. Uh, Jamak Dagani, creator of Data Mesh, for example. I've wanted to interview her forever. Finally, I'm going to be able to do it. Um, so if you're going to Data Council, check it out. There's lots of after parties and stuff. I don't totally have my schedule figured out, but when I do, I will get it posted. So if you want to grab a pint at the pub in Austin, we'll be able to do that as well. Okay. Uh, so let me go ahead then. Without uh, further ado, let's welcome Ollie Hughes to the Super Data Brothers show. Ollie, how are you? Hello. Good afternoon. Good, good morning. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is just afternoon here at this point. Uh, it's cool. 12 yeah. o'clock. Um, yeah. So, uh, Ollie, CEO of Count, uh, second time on the show. You were, I think, our second guest when the show started over a year ago. I've loved watching it since. It's the intro music which gets me every time. It's so pumped. You know, my kids walk around the house like like beatboxing that uh, that song all the time. Yeah, um, yeah, it's high energy. It's yes, it's nice it's very yeah, thanks for asking me to come. Yeah, no, th thanks for coming on. Uh, so we're we're kicking off this new series on on top BI tools to try to educate people on. You know, our theory on the show is like like the Power BI Tableau way of doing things has kind of reached its natural end state. Um, you know, for a lot of reasons. AI is maybe one of those, but it's not the only one. Like that, mm -hmm. that way of of doing analytics, that tool set was was getting a little long in the tooth, and it's time for some new innovative stuff to come in. So we're doing this series, and of course we have to kick the series off by inviting you onto the show because Count is so different from the the dominant, you know, BI paradigm. And so why don't we start with like the story of Count? Just tell us a little bit about how you came to, to develop this data and analytics canvas and, and you know the story of where it came from and what it is fundamentally oh well, it's a story littered with lots of mistakes and wrong turns uh yeah it's a, it's a good story um so i back I background i uh used to do data projects at like tesco one of the europe's biggest retailers um that's a long time ago then i became a uh, a management consultant for my sins and did a lot of data projects there. Obviously, there's a lot of data there generally um, using tools like Power BI and finding them, finding that the workflow, the kind of ability to influence and drive clients to understand their data better, make decisions like often very big decisions with that kind of tool was really difficult. Like it's, and it's a acute pain which people see that in businesses generally, if you're an internal data team, but it's even more acute if you're a management consultant because you, literally live and breathe like that kind of decision point and you these tools make it really hard to explain so a lot of that led to thinking about how to do how to make it a bit of data tool which actually leads to decision making uh we went down uh for a, over about a year and a half like a collaborative notebook tool uh had some success with that and then found that in reality that there was an improvement like a data notebook paradigm has it has a lot of limitations which are very similar to dashboards um, it still doesn't drive clarity for the wider business. And in, it may give improvements to the analyst, potentially like their workflow, like a Jupyter Notebook does, but it doesn't improve the uh, collective understanding between that between the data team and the business. And that's what led to the canvas, trying to find much a much better collaborative paradigm by default 
And I think that it's been an amazing journey. We started off thinking about it as a storytelling tool. It's grown. We've realized the paradigm enables a, a, this is just a shift in terms of how you report data, how you do exploration, and how you do data modeling. And I'll give you a bit of a feel of those, of those three capabilities um, in a bit. But yeah, it's um, it's changing how data teams operate. It's changing their operating model. It's making them more efficient. It's um, allowing the data team to have higher impact in the way they communicate and work together, but also with the wider business. Um, so we're pretty chuffed. I'd love to pretend it was all a wise plan from the start, but it was more just learning and iterating and pivoting and giving ourselves the time and space to do that, which has led to where we got to. Yeah, I, I mean, and I think there's a good lesson here for anybody, certainly anybody in the startup space, but even if you're you know, just on a data team, I, I think uh, it's very similar. There's what you set out to do and then and where you, what you discover is valuable along the way. Those two things may be very different. Right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's particularly difficult in BI because I'm not sure anyone who's built a BI tool will know is there's the kind of a core concept of an idea, an ethos, which is a big leap generally, can be a big leap and a big bet. But to actually make a BI tool sellable yeah. requires years, years <laughs> yes. of additional features. Like it is not, there's kind of that kind of initial idea, but then to actually make it something which a business can rely upon, use, is robust, is rock solid. Like that's why Power BI and Tableau are still going because they have a moat uh, around them of all the use cases that you need. And we're finally at that point where, um, you know, we have listed organizations, large FTSE 100s using us, and it's, it's great to get to that point, but it's not been quick. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so why don't we go ahead then and, uh, let, I mean, let's just jump in and, and look at it, right? Uh, that, yeah. that's the proof is, uh, is in the pudding as they say. Now, once again, I will remind you all watching, Live show, okay? So uh, let's pretend we're not on LinkedIn, that we're on Twitch. So like when the demo goes wrong, I need you to type wrecked in all caps and that sort of thing. Um, if, if, we could, uh, if we could bring that kind of energy to the live stream here. Okay, so well, the way we're gonna do this actually, I'm gonna share my screen to start and then at some point we're gonna swap over because Ollie's gonna be doing more of the developer experience, right? Uh, but maybe we'll kind of start with me coming into the tool sure. as as a, you know, maybe in a user persona. You're my business user. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So just let me get uh, this set up here. Of course, I have to mess with my setup. Okay, here we go. Very excited for this. Um, and for those of you watching, like I, I will tell you, I, I absolutely adore this, this, uh, this tool. I think it is incredible. So let's share my screen here. Yes. Okay. So here I've got an invite to count. And uh, what you can see on the screen is it says view canvas. So oh, you really are being brave here. You're going to make me do authentication as well. You're going right <laughs> from the start. <laughs> That's right. This is a, this is a total, uh, total review. You take some cookies then. Okay. Accept all continue with Google. Sounds good. So I Google guess. and Microsoft authentication. Um, yes, continue. All right. Cool. So I'm coming into count. Uh, I've got the, it's loading. All right, so now I'm in. So Boom. here we are right off the bat. This does not look like a BI tool. No, no, not at all. You're, I mean, this is actually... As you can already tell, it's there's a lot of stuff on this page. This is our demo canvas, right? It's intentionally got a lot of things to walk through, but not, we don't cover them all in one go. But just to give you a sense of the scale here, there are six operational reports. There are various different um, slides in here, diagrams, all the things we need to talk to the program with you. Um, so it's all here. And I can see you. You're here as well. Here we yeah. are together. So here we go. I'm going to zoom in. And, and, and one of the differences here, I'll actually just follow you, Ollie, so we can sure. see. Like, here we can see. Ollie's uh, mouse cursor uh, pointer on the the canvas as it moves around in real time, right? Yeah, exactly. This is an infinite collaborative canvas. Everything is everything. Everyone in this view is in real time. You can see every edit. If I scroll through this data here on this table, this result cell, you'll see it scroll on your screen because yep. we're looking at the same data at the same time. Um, uh, we're we're working in real time together, and this could be. 
two analysts, two data engineers, a data engineer and an analyst and a business user all working through a problem together. That's the whole idea of it. If we scroll down to this diagram, this is often how we describe, if you, if you follow me here, this is how we describe the product. It's enabling these three user groups to work seamlessly in one workflow where data engineers and analysts can work through data models, can iterate and de debug their, 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 their data pipelines together. <laughs> but then also the data analyst can bring in the business user work through problems and have an agile exploration workflow with them alongside just building reports alongside so them. This, so this, is the, this is the kind of the glue. It's allowing yeah. these three teams who are often very siloed with lots of information which can't be shared easily between them working in a sort of agile way across as they build out reports, data models and, and explore the data in their business. Yeah, and we've got uh, a couple comments here. Uh, you know, uh, Rohit says it looks like Figma. Absolutely. Do you hear that a lot? Like when people come in, are they like, "Oh, this yeah. looks like Figma, and this looks like Miro"? That's, that's very flattering. It's it's like we call, often call the Figma for data. Yeah, that's often how it's described. Figma for data, and then a uh, friend of the show, Richard Ashton, uh, get calling in from the UK. Richard is here like every week, uh, so thank you, Richard, for uh, for tuning in again. Oh, it's good, good to see you. Um, okay, so so. <laughs> The paradigm let's talk let's build up from building blocks up so we'll start yep. with like the building blocks and how that fits together how that works within modeling reporting exploration um but we'll just get the basics of like what's going on this infinite canvas so mm -hmm. if you know mirror or figma it is a very similar environment to this but obviously it's completely geared towards the power user user building high advanced analytics in the in the canvas so let's first start just by showing what sounds like a very simple thing but things like objects like qualitative information so how i've got a sticky note ryan you can build your own sticky notes if you want to down the bottom there um i can even add a screenshot of your beautiful face into this tool we can draw <laughs> on your face wonderful, wonderful. Let's give you some sort of you know <laughs> rabbit ears this, these are, there's all the kind of collaborative tools that we're already used to maybe in other kind of collaborative environments we have in the product and it sounds so simple to do this, but it's it's so essential to allow you to collaborate across the full analytical workflow, scoping out what we're going to be building, drawing the report you build before you build it, annotating your work with assumptions, helping you as your an analyst thinking through the complexity of your work and annotating it for yourself, or communicating like a story with annotations or just business objects like screenshots of your app or your website. All that stuff is the glue which makes the data you're doing make sense. And that's what these these tools are here for, um, as well as making Ron look amazing. <laughs> and so um, this type of thing here, like this, uh, you know, this kind of collaborative process, this planning, you know, idea generation, this is in virtually every other BI tool. This is still happening, hopefully but it's not happening in the tool, right? Like we're, we're doing this, we might be doing this in Miro or, you know, many, I mean, the reality is many teams aren't doing enough of this at all today. Sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the differentiation itself, but it is the glue which makes the rest of the workflow make sense. Right. And so, okay. And so we've kind of got the collaborative whiteboard feature set, sticky exactly. notes, you know, diagramming, you know, uh, Every, you know, everybody, like I did one of these yesterday and you know, I got five people in there. It's like, everybody get your ideas out. What could we build? That sort of stuff you can do right here in tool. It's, it's, it's essential to, yeah, that, that part, the annotation of assumptions, well, it's, you realize very quickly, this kind of stuff is missing when you're working in a very sync. We often have very single task oriented tools. Like this is the UI for building a SQL query. This is the UI to building a chart. And the problem is we haven't got a way to cut a workflow which cuts across all those silos. And mm -hmm. that's when this kind of stuff is really important. The second paradigm then is this idea of cells and cells, just like a Jupyter notebook, if you use that, these are computational blocks. We have an input and an output and it can run on in memory or it can run on an external data source. And we have a few different types of cells. This is a SQL cell. So we can see here a, a pretty long gnarly DBT model in here. And it's we've done running this on a BigQuery database right now. Um, we've got about four different databases in this canvas on the, on the left here, wow. different colors. And this one's pulling back some data from from big crits. It's a it's a fact table on MBA data, which Taylor from the team is a big fan of. Yes. But when you then these cells, you can have different types. We can also then have a Python cell, 
I won't run any complicated Python right now, but this is a this this is a box where I'm building that data set into a, a data frame. I can oh, then wow. um and this already shows you the paradigm here, which is that I can refer to the results of a previous cell again. So this arrow is showing us the lineage of this. So from a SQL cell to a Python cell, I can then go back to SQL again. Let's do a count of the rows of this data frame in SQL. And I can also, these cells can also be filter cells. They can be visual cells. So I'll quickly build a visual on the left here, um, just in the sense of the, like which players have won the most games. And this is the, the way, the other paradigm, each of these blocks of code linked to each other so if i was to change the query above running on bigquery here and added a limit 20 because i'm not going to write complicated sql mm -hmm. that change will now cascade through all the arrows effectively giving you an updated visualization oh, and wow. this is where you can start to iterate permeate and lay out your logic as you build and explore the data in this two-dimensional way so the other paradigm here is bringing all the capabilities you may have in different tools in our workflow a Python cell, a SQL cell, some visualization, and I'm bringing them together into one linear we call analytical DAG, where these 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 cells are re referencing each other can rerun. Oh wow! Okay, and so so you know so here you've up top we've got a SQL cell, and now you've got that feeding this Python cell, which then feeds back into a SQL cell, and this SQL cell is also feeding this visualization. That's right. Uh, I'll refresh the page. Uh, that is quite uh, impressive. So, so those, so you've got SQL, you've got some sort of visualization builder, you've got um, uh, Python in here. Is this primarily kind of, you know, this set of features? Is this data analysts who are using this? Yeah. So I think this is what I was saying. So this is a, this is where you can do things like prototyping out your data pipeline. You can build from it. You could use a Python cell, pull in data from a new API. You could refine that data model. You can use SQL and get the whole end to end built, even the end report built in one canvas before you productionize. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that your analyst is doing some sort of exploratory work. They're taking a, 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 a DBT model and then they're forking it to explore and, and build a new kind of um, fact table or a new kind of report as well. Let me let's move up. One of the things which is also powerful about the canvas, which is again quite unique is because these objects are with are objects themselves in a two-dimensional space. They are objects. So a query is not just a thing you write and get a result from. It is an object you can move, you can duplicate, just like it was a, 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 a post-it note. And we can even move it over here. So you've got this kind of wonderful layout view where logic like this can be moved around, spatially laid out based on how you're thinking of the problem. But we can also use the space of the canvas to simplify all this logic. This query is 159 lines of SQL, pretty standard for a transformational query. But in the canvas, I can, ex what we call explode it. And exploding Whoa. it means that I'm splitting out each piece of logic, each CTE of this model into a separate cell where I can see the interim results, I can see the lineage, and I can work through this in real time with the team to understand why it's broken, how it needs to be refactored. And this is really where the two dimensionality of the canvas, the infinite space the canvas gives you lets you see what's about 12 different queries in one space in full context. And I can collaborate on this with you. And you just, you, so you wait, you just hit a button and it, it just like broke all the CTE. Like that was, so you had one cell with, you know, a, a model with all these CTEs, you hit a single button in it and it's. Do it again. <laughs> okay. Bang. Wow. Okay. That is, um, because this is quite a problem people have, you, you know, especially if you're working in DBT, you've got these, you know, these SQL models you've built and figuring out the logic of the SQL model, especially if you're not the one who built it, is quite a challenge. Um, and so this, you know, you hit a single button and now we've we've actually spatially arranged the CTEs as far as how they logically exactly. reference one another. And then you can also take these three cells on the right here and just duplicate them. You can literally oh, okay. take a fraction of that DAG, move it across, refactor it, look at, look, compare them side by side, and then recompile it if you wanted to. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of users use this as a DBT IDE, a place to build DBT models to take all that logic that's hidden away in a GitHub repository and make it visible, make it dynamic, make it something you can edit and then push back to DBT. Um, so you, so I could take this and now, 
Let's talk about that DBT integration point for a second. Can I? Yeah. I can just pull these out of DBT and then I can push them back into it from this exactly. interface. Yeah. Wow. That's okay. It. Yeah, and we can run this. We can run uncompiled SQL with Ginger templating directly in the canvas as well. You can refer oh. to different. I can bring some in if you'd like. Actually, yeah, yeah, and I, I can see that on the left hand side here. When I look at my data sources, a couple of them have the DBT logo. So that this is telling me this is BigQuery and not, not, the data source is BigQuery, and I have a DBT model associated. Exactly. With it. So I'm now going to bring in. A, um, I've got in my list of schema and tables of some models. I can now add them as uncompiled SQL. So now we've got here um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven DBT models. This one down here, you can see is the final, is the final model. Yeah. And you can see here that we've got the config section. We've got the different refs. We can see what that will compile to if we hover over it. We can also compare the SQL compiled versus uncompiled and, 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 and dynamically update it and then push it back to DBT. And it's doing this in a in a way which is fully interactive, fully collaborative. And the amazing part of this is, it, again, it's the fact that DBT models aren't the end artifact. The end artifact is the analysis. It's the getting the business to see this logic and work through it with you if you need to. It's the kind of right. all this thousand lots of code which data teams build, which no one has any visibility of, suddenly can be seen, talked through, and, assume, and, and understood with post-it notes to describe it if you want to. Yeah. So is that because uh, that, I mean, this is a classic problem of, uh, of data teams in general is, you know, we build all this stuff, but nobody understands it. Um, and, and is that, so would you do that? Like, would you, would someone, you know, say this model, you know, come in here, maybe annotate it with post-it notes or screenshots of what it does or, you know, whatever it is. And then would you actually take a business person in and obviously you're not going to walk them through the code, but maybe explain the logic and make sure that it's correct or something like that. That, that's, that often happens. Like we've had a, one of our customers um, uh, had a problem where a data uh, a bug in the in the in their, in their DBT models was causing them to lose. I think it was like many thousands of dollars a week because they had a misreconciliation with their their voucher system, and they actually had the the, the data team working through the, the debugging this alongside the CFO who was in here with like the ledger from there from their sales force trying to work out what was going on. And it, so you that that scenario is is happening. What's more common? is when you're building out a new report. The analyst is therefore built, taking some of this DBT mod logic as a starting point, building out an operational dashboard or report, getting validation as they build with us with the stakeholders. At the end of that process, when they want to actually finalize the report, they take the new logic they've built and refactor into the DBT models and then push that back to DBT so that the whole workflow of modeling report and validation usage by the, the, by the business has been built together in one unified workflow. And it's much more efficient, much less um, wasted work because you're getting validation and value up front before you then model that. I mean, this, this is something we talk about so much on this show, Ali, is, um, you know, we have a saying like your, your users don't know what they want until you give it to them. Um, you know, they, they may know, they may have an ask, but, but the initial thing that a business person is asking for is often... It, you know, it's their first idea. And what I've found over the course of my career many times is that if I deliver exactly what they asked for, they're usually happy for about two days. And then all the follow on questions start to come in, right? The, oh, but I also need this, but I also need that. You know, now that I see the dashboard, it turns out that it's not exactly what I wanted. Um, Using a process like this, where you can kind of get their input in this collaborative canvas, I'm one. I'm I'm wondering, like, do, does that kind of shorten or even short circuit that process, where maybe you can more quickly give them, like, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So the one of the values propositions of the product is it, it shortens time to value by half because yeah. you have this ability to show methodology and show interim present interim outputs as you build towards a final output and it allows you and the stakeholder to steer or they're really looking for get validation before you build too much before it gets you know dashboarding tools develop an incredible waterfall like development cycle which isn't yeah. even doesn't exist in code anymore but it exists in data still and so it allows you this iterative loop where you can iterate and if you need to make a change you can make a change in the dag it will refollow through anyway it's a much faster place for a data analyst to work much easier for them to deal with the complexity of their modeling, their reporting, exploration at, the, at that point, 
and then obviously allows them to validate with the business that this is a report they can trust. They can answer all those questions before they productionize it. That's uh, that's very cool. I think um, for those of you who are just joining, you know, I, I would just point out that uh, it's actually, you know, this is a live collaborative environment. So, you know, we're talking about working with the business. Uh, I am the one sharing my screen here and I'm able to see everything Ali like he is doing. He is walking me through the capabilities of the tool, you know, even though I'm sharing my screen because we're sharing this mutual session and I can see yeah. everything he's doing, which is part of the magic here. Should we move on to some analytics? We've done a lot of data yeah. modeling now. Yeah, so, so we and, and we got this request, you know, from uh, from uh, Rohit earlier. He said, "This looks great for design time collaboration. How does this get productionized? How how do you actually build out those end user facing, uh, business person facing objects?" Let's do it. Let's go down. We'll go down to the other part of the uh, some of these worked out analytical examples. We've got six different examples here we can walk through. So. Um, one of the benefits of the canvas is that it, it, it gives you a much more flexible presentation layer than than any other tool I know of, actually. Um, like down here is just one of my favorite examples, actually. This is, a, this is actually a customer case study that we've anonymized. Um, but what we've got here in this in this white box, this kind of with an at red outline, is an onboarding funnel. This is could be any process, but in this case, it's a kind of the user journey, user flow through a, a, a mobile phone onboarding flow where they, they start off by downloading the app and then we go through the stages of the UI the user goes through and we've got then the conversion rates and activity numbers mm. of those users to the product. Even if it's forks, even if the process is quite complicated as a fork, we can lay that out. And these numbers are then live from the database. These are, this is driving this report to show what, what is actually 26 metrics in a contextualized form and actually maps to wow. what the actual business environment is. Imagine trying to see 26 metrics in one dashboard. Um, so that is that is a very common use case for count. It's you can build dashboards. We can I can build one for you later. But the core idea is presenting numbers in context in a way which actually makes sense, but could still be an operationalized report. Um, and this, yeah. sorry, yeah, this I mean this type of of kind of data flow is something that dashboarding tools are just notoriously terrible at, um, and and it's very common. I, I think this is like you see. You know, on LinkedIn, you see more and more people talking about metric trees or decision trees, you know, kind of like the importance of spatial layouts that have logic built into the, you know, into the way it's laid out is like part of the understanding, not just how do I make this look cool, which is, you know, primarily what you're tasked with doing in dashboards, but how, uh, you know, how do I actually lay this out in a way that aids in the understanding, tells a logical story from beginning to end. Exactly. And it's very powerful here. Yeah, exactly. And we, um, you can absolutely share. So this, the idea here is that this was built, this flow was built by a product manager originally. Mm. Um, and then the analyst came in with them, validated it. And then you can see down here, the logic that the analyst then built to define these metrics. And by clicking on a, if you click on an image, uh, a cell in here in edit mode, you'll be able to then see, if you click on that yourself, Ryan, that cell I'm click, hovering mm -hmm. over, you'll see the lineage of that, which metrics this cell is then driven by. Ah, so okay. These arrows show you this query is driving these metrics. The lineage, the, the how this has been built can be validated and explained. It's not just sent out in isolation. You have the ability to show there's transparency to methodology here, which is really important in the building and the building of trust of how it's being built. Yeah, right. Yeah. So so this would be, I mean, this is like <laughs> such an easier form of validation than, you know, uh, here's my requirements document. And you can see on the requirements document, it says like, here's the logic and now here's the dashboard. And, you know, it's like, this is just, okay, we click on it. This drives these things. Is this right? Yes. Done. And back to um, Rohit's question. If we, if I'm not sure actually underneath the Super Data Brothers logo, you should have a report button, Ryan. I'm not sure if you can see that button. Yeah, right here. So the yeah, report it's... button, oh, what have we done here? I need to refresh the page. Yeah, um, okay. The report button allows you to present these, these white boxes, we call them frames, as operational reports. It lifts those frames out of the canvas and makes them into a presentation layer. And that's where you can put, operationalize these assets. You can okay. lock it down and then present them as a, as a slideshow, effectively. Okay, so I've hit the report button here. So for those of you who are wondering, how do you uh, how do you productionalize this? I've hit the report button, and now 
all the rest of that logic is gone. And I'm just seeing kind of this output. Yeah, it's, it actually seems to be a bit weirdly, really centered in your in your in your massive, massive TV screen, massive, massive monitor thing. But normally it would be full page. Yeah. Um, and you'll be able to see that. And that that's the way that people consume this. Like I said, I mean, it's basically a dashboard view, yeah. but obviously the shape and flow of this is much is 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 could be any shape, could be a notebook, could be a presentation deck, could be a metric tree, could be a process flow map, but it is a way to make that an operational report rather than having to deal with the the full workflow of building it. Yeah. Um, but what you'd be surprised to hear is that most of our customers, only a very, a very small fraction of these reports become operational because you only want to have a very small number of operational reports. And then the rest of it is more transient, is more exploratory, is more helping a business user work through a problem. And that's why the camps are so great. Yeah, I can see like for, for problem solving and a lot of what data teams, I, f I find in a way, this is the kind of the work that they wish they could be doing and not building and maintaining and supporting operational reports. Um, that's very important, you know, but these kind of, you know, this is more, I don't want to use the word valuable, but this sort of thing to solve these challenging data problems that, that help people make important point in time decisions you know, versus having a, you know, how are, are we hitting our sales goals every week? You know, what was our, like, this is the type of thing most of the data teams I know want, want to uh, focus on. Now, is this interactive? Like, I can see this filters section up here in Please the corner. Do. Yeah, you can drag it. You can drag those filters. You can update them as you need to. You have, still have that kind of op, that kind of dashboarding oh, yeah. and splicing you might want, but it's done in a, in a framework which is much more contextualized. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Like one of the things we've come to realize with our customers is that dashboards give a very poor view of a holistic view of business performance. Like we have businesses have a mosaic of different facets of the true answer, what's really going on in their business. And what we're finding with the canvas with count is that it allows them to have a much better holistic overview of what's really going on, mapping their core processes across, um, across the whole business and give that kind of focus about what's really happening. So it's we've evolved, and it, over time we found that it's not just about uh, a collaborative and Figma for data for collaboration and exploration. It's becoming a place for data modeling and a place for driving better operational oversight as well. But the win is the fact you can do all those three in one seamless workflow, and you can move yeah. between modeling and reporting and exploration as you need to, depending on the need. Yeah. Now this, um, you know, one thing I see, like as I update these, it's. I like it's super fast. So is, you know, one thing with BI tools, you start to get, like you mentioned, all the stuff you have to put into a BI tool once you start building one, right? One of the ones is, okay, the query mode. Am I live querying the data or am I extracting the data and storing it in a cache somehow? What's going on under the hood as I interact with these filters? Yeah, uh, if you come back into canvas mode, that's what a classic example of like where it's helped to go back into the canvas and talk through it. And what's really going on under the hood in the model here? Um, okay. So, in count, you have the option of running your queries directly on your database. So, um, and you also have the ability to be have DuckDB in memory running in your browser to let you do uh, small, like effectively allows you a kind of millisecond response time for a subset of data which may be relevant to the actual report you're building, um, and that's really what we're. We, have, we let you have that, the, the author has that flexibility to choose between, I want this to be running on the database. I want it to be running, I want to build a subset, a data subset in the canvas, which then I build the rest of my report from. We let you choose that node point when you switch from local to, to cloud. Um, uh, but but it does allow you that kind of seem, if you can build a report, when you finalize the operational report, you know the filters you're going to be using. It's best practice then to build that, flat file effectively, which drives most of it as a local DuckDB, effectively data frame, and then letting the and then the end users can then slot splice that in millisecond speed. Um, that's generally the best practice we're finding. But that, that we, we, we have this kind of serverless model where we use the supercomputer on your laptop, in your laptop, as well as your, as your database to let you balance load. And it gives a much faster response time and lets you use what a database is great for, which is large scale analytics, yeah. and let your laptop work for you in terms of getting speed. The fun bit is making sure that everyone who's in the canvas at the same time, like you and I right now, we've got, we're running separate computation in our different laptops, but we're seeing the same number. And that's always a bit fun. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't thought, 
I haven't thought about that. Right, right. The local processing, it must be quite a task, right? Uh, to, to be doing local processing on you know, seven laptops and yet we're all having a shared real-time experience. Exactly. And then the the other part of this is obviously the scale, right? I mean, this, we said this is our demo canvas. It's obviously got a lot of things in here. It's probably more yeah. than most use cases. Would Normally it's one report per canvas or one exploration per canvas, but we've the one that we have to enable with count, which is again, is being tricky, is how do we let the scale, the infinite canvas means an infinite number of data assets. How do we let you scale to a fact you can have a 400 different queries in this in this thing? How do we deal with that scale? Over here, actually, just to make that point explicit, this is actually a visualization of 100,000 data points literally oh, plotted individually in this chart. And it's obviously one of about 40 in this canvas. We have to enable the scale of the canvas to flex, to allow that kind of asset to exist. Um, 100,000 is probably a bit ex excessive. It's but, a lot. Um, the scalability of the canvas to run for multiple users across hundreds of assets is another big technical problem that that a normal BI tool doesn't have to worry about because it's to show five charts in one dashboard. We have to show hundreds of charts in one view if you zoom out to my, you know, two percent zoom, and that's another are, challenge. Are, do you have customers like what? What is the the largest number of of charts, say, or or cells, or you know, just objects in a single canvas that you're aware of in production? I think we've seen people doing a database tram migration where they're doing like they're running with queries on like Redshift or another data warehouse. Others that do exist um, and migrating between them where they're literally laying out table by table the results of each of these different tables and mapping them and comparing them. Um, that was like I think that was a 750 Whew. cell canvas, <laughs> uh, mostly SQL. Um, but yeah, it, that's the kind of level at which you. You know the the power the power of the canvas is you can deal with that level of complexity. Imagine dealing with that in a in a few tabs of your SQL editor. It's oh yeah, the, that's the right. Problem. I mean, it would be... working. It's a different scale of working. It's a different, more fluid way of working. It's a very. We regularly have customers come to us who are looking for a uh, like the idea of a data whiteboard. They have absolutely no idea what they've walked into, and they suddenly see a very different, completely different paradigm. <laughs> How much? Uh, so the the layouting. You know, Rohit's question about like productionalization. You know, we kind of saw okay, there's a reporting mode that narrows my focus to just these output objects. How how do you um, you know how do you how do you sh like share that with someone? I mean, is there like a report repository somewhere, or or you know how how do you actually get that content into people's hands? Sure. So there there's a few different ways. That works. Um, obviously, there's a hierarchy behind the BI tool, like every BI tool, we're solving the problem for how do I have different folders, different hierarchies, different ways to search through assets to find the report which is most relevant? How do I know the difference between an operational report and a kind of transient report? We deal all that behind the scenes. I won't go through that now. Mm -hmm. But the one thing which we really, really believe when it comes to operational reporting is that it should be consumed at the point of the easiest point for, for the business, which is often their phone in their instant messaging platform, wherever it is. So we have this concept of alerts and alerts are effectively allowing you to take a frame, as we discussed before, these white boxes, these productionizable, like pixel perfect assets. And you can then pu push these on a schedule or based on a trigger point written in Python or SQL and pushing that to a, a, a mailing list or a Slack channel um, or to your email, your individual email addresses based on logic or timing. And that actually means you can start to set, um, we call it push notification, push, like put operational reporting is done as a push based approach. And because you can build different frames in the same report of the same logic, you can schedule a report within one canvas to be different, different levels of granularity. You can have a weekly summary, a daily summary, which is, is more condensed. And then you can have a number of trigger points saying if a conversion rate hits a certain threshold, alert me at that point. So you can have a cascade of reporting off the same core process, but running at different cadences, different time frames. And that's, again, a very powerful way where because you haven't just got one dashboard, one report per entity, you can have multiple within a canvas. You can have a different cadence of how you send information out to the business. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can see. And, and being able to see them all in one place, right? Like instead of having the monthly dashboard, the weekly dashboard and the daily dashboard, which you've only done because you need three separate objects in order to schedule them at three separate times, which is something I've seen in many BI tools, right? Each object yeah. can have a single schedule. Yeah. Um, here we're, we're, we're setting, and these are like data triggered alerts. Like I could say, okay, if this you know, threshold, if it exceeds a particular, like here, you know, if it goes above 25%, I want you to email Ollie. Exactly. Or it could be a logic could be saying, give me, let's look, calculate the, the, the average of this metric over the last two months. If it goes one standard deviation above that trigger me. Cause that's really the valuable thing. I, I think that like, Oh, tell me if this goes above a million dollars is kind of whatever at this point, it's, it's the, it's the standard deviation change period over period. That sort of thing is where the real value in alerting comes in, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, clearly this, this is obviously a very simple, intentionally simple sort of metric tracker. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we also, you can also have it so you can pull it, pull the data from an API and then trigger based on API, an external API source. We have one internally as a team for all our birthdays. So we get a, we get a birthday cake sent into this, into Slack for everyone's birthday on the day, because, you know, this is actually quite a flexible, a flexible, a flexible logic means you have lots of fun. So let's uh, let's talk about you know who is using this today and what types of things are they doing with it. Like first of all, with your customers, you know, is this predominantly adopted by kind of modern data stack startup data teams, or or are you seeing it, you know, in kind of mid market or enterprise levels at all? Like who who today is is being successful with this? Yeah, so we have our customers across a range of different industries. Most of them, as you say, have are using DBT, they're using a cloud data warehouse. They see that as the core of their backend uh, data stack. Uh, they get the benefits of that being on cloud and using DBT for version control, but they effectively are looking for a different interface, a different operating model for the front end of the stack. They're looking for a way to be more agile, be more collaborative. They find their 20 year old BI tool is a pretty terrible asset now, given what they've done on the back end. Uh, and they're looking for a way to enhance collaboration across their teams. So they're going to use it for DBT modeling, for example, but also as a way to work with the business better. So predominantly, it is sort of scale ups who are scale up startups who are using Mon Data Stack. But that's wonderfully changing over time. We're getting slightly larger organizations getting involved now as they're looking for a new answer. It's quite interesting. And the Mon Data Stack is already going up, upscale. And so we're sort of following that path ourselves. Um, we're also okay. finding it being quite useful for um, consultancy firms who are using us as like a way to do their projects end to end, give visibility of all the work they're providing with the client, get their client validation. All that stuff is another very natural, which is obviously where I started. So yeah. like that coming back, back to me. Yeah, I was. I, I mean, I was just going to ask that because looking at this, you know, my also background in consulting, I, I look at this and I think, okay, this would be potentially extremely useful uh, as a consultant to to make sure your what you're building is valuable, line up the logic, get everything right, get the buy-in, even if the client ultimately you know owns Power BI and what I'm going to build potentially is in Power BI, I would even I, I could see myself still choosing to to use kind of this approach and this paradigm of working to before I touch Power BI at all in order to make sure that what I'm building is actually valuable. Yeah. Do you, do, yeah. Does this live alongside other BI tools? Like, are there people like, okay, this is our analytics tool, our problem solving tool, and we've got Looker or Tableau or Power BI for like, you know, the dashboard that everybody checks on Monday morning? We absolutely see that. So this is often how we describe uh, and I'm positioning on the product. So this is amazing. We, I just want to highlight, you. you have this in the BI tool. Yeah, sure. Exactly. You, you didn't. You didn't like. You didn't swap over to your PowerPoint presentation to say, "Actually, I have a slide for that." You literally went from, "Here's a data-driven alert" to, "Here's my, here's my like systems diagram." Okay, sorry to cut you off. But no, yeah, no, that's that's exactly it. I mean, if you want to drive impact, you've got to better communicate. You know, that's the gig. That's the gig. So we often, like, we often say, "Look, we 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 are wonderfully have the flexibility within the tool that we can be bought in as a complement to an existing what we call traditional BI tool." Um, a lot of teams already have that. And the beauty of count is that you can use us as a way to augment that, to remove a lot of the workflow, which shouldn't be, they are not ideal for, um, and, and give yourself a huge productivity increase and improve the way you work with the business. So 
if you have Tableau, Looker, they're usually the incumbents that we're dealing with. They're, yeah, if you're using it for KPR reporting and self-service, that's fine. But they're a consumption tool. Let's pretend they're nothing more than that. They're an operational metrics tool for trusted data. They're a one-way communication tool where people can consume numbers uh, and obviously count. That is not the capability, which that's kind of, in some ways, that's the capability a lot of BI tools can do. And count can yeah. do that on steroids with a very different kind of looking report and a much more flexible self-service environment. So we, we, we are that. Customers are often rolling into that with us, but they buy us initially for all the workflows of storytelling, requirements gathering, exploratory analysis, defining data models and doing debugging DBT queries. And these, these workflows are by nature iterative, they're collaborative, and that's where Count really sings. That's where Count is driving a different way of working. And then above on these ones, we're then just ch we're changing the way that you can present your operational reports. And so over time, we see people reducing their usage of their traditional BI tool, and with many people then rolling off and on onboarding to us over to, uh, completely. But it's we're fortunate to have that breadth in a, a use case, which means you can start with us alongside. Let's talk about uh, self service for a second here. Um... Do I need to know how to code to use this? Or is there some sort of no-code, low-code builder experience for people who, who don't know SQL? Uh, there's a low-code built in. And that's going to get very powerful in about two weeks' time. Okay. So watch this space. Uh, is that is that the message? Kind of a, you maybe do an exclusive without any blowing to Ryan. But there you go. Good questioning. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I can see I'm just trying to, you know, like uh, I can think I'm trying to think of, yeah, what, what, because uh, I think this is very powerful, um, but I could see someone saying, you know, maybe this would be really good for, for me because I know SQL and Python and I understand, you know, what a DAG is, but how's my user going to come in here and build anything with this? And we've already seen like you can build consumption interfaces, you've, you know, you've got filters on Canvas and that sort of thing. So, uh, but they, you know, it sounds like currently and maybe in a couple of weeks, folks, uh, there will be more and more kind of self-service, low-code, no-code building in, abilities. In many ways, if you think about the interaction levels we've got in the canvas, the, the power is you can have someone who can write Python, working with someone who can't write Python, but can write SQL, having working with someone who can write, who can bring, like, can bring business context and bring in screenshots and pictures in here and working together. That, that middle rung of like low code user is what we're going to be completing. And then suddenly you've got this wonderful seamless moving between someone working low code and analysts can come in and then augment that with them if they get stuck. One of the things of, one of the beauties of the Canvas interface, like generally in this kind of spatial computing landscape, which we're seeing across many different tool types is because the way you focus your viewport gives you the complexity or lack of. If I zoom in on a Python cell, like this, suddenly things get a bit more complicated. That's probably not a good example. Let's look over here. Uh, like this, by zooming in on this cell, suddenly I'm now in a Python, very technical environment. By moving over here, I'm now in a SQL environment. By moving over here, I'm in a place where any any user understands what's, what's going on here can, and contribute to this. And that's the real power is you have these different levels of user literacy, in, in, in that one, one, one's a better word, working together. And we just one of the things we're now working on is how do we make that middle layer as powerful as possible? That low code is really quite is, is that low code user can work pretty free within here. There are some notations currently which we're going to be fixing, basically. Oh, excellent. Um, all right, we got 10 minutes left. So uh, this has been very enlightening. And I, I I'm I was I wanted to make sure that we started the you know top emerging tools of 2024 with count because because this is just so refreshing and such a, a unique take on how to do collaboration and within a business intelligence tool instead of instead of putting it all somewhere else and hoping it happens, right? Um, what's, uh, so for, is there anything you wanna highlight that we haven't gotten to yet? I, mean, I think we've kind of come through the user, the developer user journey here. Um, we've looked at alerting, we've looked at building things, Python, SQL, dashboards, non-traditional uh, ways to display data. What what do you want to show that we haven't seen, if anything? Uh, there's loads to show. We've got, we've, we've sort of scratched the surface of those three different capabilities, data modeling, exploration, and storytelling, and then reporting. And I think we've covered those in, in shallow detail. I think to do a, what we more, what I would encourage people to do is to go look at the website at count.co, 
have a look around, see the video, see what it's like to be the analyst. We've been showing this all from the view of the of the of like the business user. Yeah. <laughs> viewpoint. We haven't even looked at what it's like to be an analyst. The viewpoint is slightly different. There's more more functionality to play with, but um, uh, it, it's a, yeah, it's a very different way of working. Uh, one which is almost has to be exp if they sort of feel that two dimensional difference. It's one of those things where. If we're being really candid, we, we've been surprised at how much this canvas paradigm shifts so many more workflows than we expected when we first started out on it. It's been a wonderful journey for us to see uh, this paradigm, so building into this paradigm more and more and solving more and more problems as we go. Excellent. So I think uh, the last question, and it's, you know, I think it's a, a sign of the times, right, that I have to ask, I have to ask it pretty much every week, it has to do with AI. Um, and so what, if, uh, what is your perspective on AI in, in, in business intelligence in general, and then how uh, kind of, if, and how you plan on applying that to, to count itself? Mm. Yeah, we've got a roadmap for AI, which we're planning on, but one of the things which we've been really, uh, we really believe, um, needs to change irrespective of AI or not is just the way that the data team and the business interacts and communicates with data. Like we, we have this really strong belief that actually um, you do, AI building dashboards, a dashboard building AI is the wrong AI to be building. <laughs> uh, like that actually one of the most, the mo one of the most critical parts of that is broken with the way they organizations interact with data is that they have, a, people have a very poor over overarching understanding of their business performance. They have a very poor understanding of their growth model. And it's because the way that dashboards force you to think is very siloed, very fractured in this mosaic. You've got this mosaic to try and pick together the whole picture. Um, and it's very difficult. And so we've, we, AI is going to be an amazing augment of efficiency. But I think actually there is a much bigger value generation, which is just coming down to giving much better organizational clarity. One of the things which we were quite excited by is we've worked really hard in Count to make it so two humans can work together and solve problems within one interface. And by complete wonderful chance, that's exactly the interface and experience you need for an AI and a human to work together to solve a problem as well. So we think we're quite well placed for AI. But what I'm what I'm what I'm seeing in the market is loads of people saying, let's keep be happy with the paradigm of how data teams work. Let's just keep building dashboards forever and make AI make that better. And we've been on the journey, which is almost orthogonal to that, saying we need to depart from that relationship. We need to depart that way of working. And AI will then enable that world to be better as well. So we haven't rushed into the AI space, is what I'm trying to say, because we don't think building AI to make the existing workflow better is the right workflow that we'll be focused on. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And that is what you see most BI tools doing. The, the obvious thing is, well, building, we're a dashboard tool and building dashboards takes a long time. So can I have the AI build it for me? Can I, can I just converse with it and have it build something close to what I would have chosen to build on my own by clicking around the UI? And, and, it's not that I don't think that's valuable. It is valuable if it, if it saves time, you know, but it's just such a, uh, it, it's just so far from the full potential that I think AI offers in terms of, of working with business people to help, help answer actual questions. And like you said, give them clarity on their business performance. You've got uh, to start with the end. Like ultimately you've got to start with the end user making a decision and, and actually that, that that can definitely be augmented by AI, but I think the black box AI approach or is definitely not not the way we're seeing users actually trust and build. So there's lots of things which I don't think, basically what I'm trying to say is I think AI is an enabler, but it's it, you need to put it on the right problems. And, and I think there's some, we, we believe in a paradigm shift in interface, which is what's going to lead to a lot of unlocking of value that's currently hidden away in, in existing tools. So I, I'm seeing a lot of people die for, Weirdly adopting this new AI paradigm, but applying it to the to an existing paradigm, which I think is massively inefficient. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it has been. It's. I think there's pressure. You know, as like someone who also works at a BI vendor, I mean, there's definitely pressure just to show really? something. For, oh, no. Yeah, but believe it or not, uh, <laughs> um, just to show something, right? Like, what's the AI? What's the AI, AI feature? What's the roadmap? I saw you know Copilot make a dashboard can you make a dashboard um 
certainly at the enterprise level, right, where you're you're mostly competing with, let's be real, Microsoft nowadays. Um, you know, there's there's that kind of pressure to just infuse the existing paradigm with AI. Totally. And I, th I think we need to think of new ways to 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 use this these powerful capabilities and not just yeah let's let's layer a chatbot into our dashboarding tool the, we the the big the big problem that i think is is as i said back before is this i is we actually is like how do you get signal from the noise like you like the last thing you want is more dashboards the last thing you want is more charts yeah but it's not the route to better clarity um and what you what you need is that what what we're finding people using count for is for data teams to move more efficiently to find the to find the signal and the noise like either by the presenting a better way of seeing an operational process which matters or by telling a better story it, it that's what that's what we're believing is we're, we're, we're excited when we see someone rip out 50 dashboards because they don't need that uh and that that's really the signal from the noise is what's going to matter most over the course of the next 15 years is going to be we have more information we could possibly do with. We've got AIs giving us instantaneous, instantaneous information. That doesn't necessarily mean better decisions. That doesn't mean that we're going to be any more informed, any clear on action. And so, yeah, efficiency, AIs will be very important undeniably, but I'm not sure anywhere close to really thinking of the product implications of that. What really, we're just building frenzically into this AI space without really thinking through the, the user journey of it. Anyway, I could rant forever about that. No, that was that was quite a rallying call, Ali. Thank you. All right, we're at the top of the hour here, folks. I want to thank you uh, for tuning in for this uh, this demonstration of Count. Ali, where can people go to uh, to check out Count and and uh, keep up with you? Sure. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, or you can just come find us on uh, Count.co, uh, C O U N T dot C O, and we're, we're 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 there. You can explore the tool, watch the demo videos. You can get in, get a free account, explore a bit more. Um, it's all right there. Excellent. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Ollie, uh, for joining us and awesome. I, I, I don't know. I, I love, I love this tool and, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, for it to be the very first tool featured in our top emerging BI tools series for 2024. So thanks for coming on today. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. The, the live demo was great fun. All right. So folks, uh, check out Count. Um, this is, you know, uh, I, I mean what I say here. This is a totally unsponsored, this is not a sponsored episode. Uh, we don't do sponsored uh, demo episodes like this. In fact, we don't do many sponsored episodes at all. Um, so uh, thank you for tuning in. As always, every Thursday, most Thursdays at noon here on the Super Data Brothers channel, both on LinkedIn and YouTube. Check out the show archive, folks. If you're watching on LinkedIn, we have a huge archive of awesome guests on YouTube. And while you're there, why don't you give us a, a like and a subscribe uh, to help us out with uh, the algorithm. Last thing I will plug here. If you are going to be in Austin, March 26th through 28th, next week for Data Council, I am going to be there. Swing by the Good Data booth. Say hello. I'd love to, to shake your hand and, and let's nerd out about data a little bit. There's lots of after party events too. I'm still sorting out what I'm going to go to, but I'll post all that stuff on LinkedIn if you want to grab a drink at some point. I am highly amenable to that. Okay. Um, so a big thank you to Ollie for coming on. Uh, say hello at Data Council, Gartner Data Analytics Summit, May 13th through 15th in London. Also here in Detroit, the Great Lakes Analytics Conference is coming up in April. It's a one-day conference in uh, in Troy, which is one of the suburbs of Detroit. I will be there. Aaron Wilkerson will be there. Uh, a couple other cool P Detroit-based data people who you may know. Uh, so if you're in the area or if you're not in the area, come swing by and say hello. Donald Farmer is the keynote. I love Donald Farmer. Uh, and so that should be really exciting to see. So come say hello, hello to me at one of these events. And... Uh, and uh, let's talk about data together. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the show. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, another great show. Thank you, Ali, for coming. As always, uh, we are the Super Data Brothers. I am Ryan. Eric will be back next week. And uh, take care, everybody. Bye.